Um, my name is Julia Anderson. I'll be moderating today's presentation and we will get started here in just a couple of minutes. Susan asked if we'll have access to recordings of today's seminars after today. The answer is yes. They will be posted at rootstech.org and several other places. I'm looking to see what those places are. I believe we are streaming on several Facebook pages and a YouTube channel. So the recording should be available um, after the fact on all of those uh, social media platforms. I bet if you Google um, Family Search DNA Day or Roots Tech DNA Day, you will find it. All right, we are going to get started with some announcements. Um, good morning and welcome to DNA Day, hosted by the Family Search Library in partnership with RootsTech. My name is Julia Anderson and I will be moderating today's presentations. For this event, we'll be presenting a total of six classes. At the end of the day, RootsTech.org will host two additional presentations from industry experts. We are so glad you can join us. And before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items. These classes are being live streamed on several platforms, including the Family Search Library's Facebook page and rootstech.org. The recordings for these classes will be available on rootstech.org in the next few days. We have created a page on the Family Search Research Wiki for all of today's class content, including the handouts for the individual classes. The link for that wiki page will be shared throughout the day in the chat. Our presenters will be answering questions at the end of each class as time allows. Please post your questions in the chat or comments section, and we will pass them along to the presenter at the end of the presentation. If you need specific help with a DNA research problem, we encourage you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our DNA specialists in a free 40-minute virtual consultation. Just go to the Family Search Library's website at familysearch.org slash library and click on research help. So let me introduce the presenter for this class, Tanner Tolman. Tanner is accredited through the International Commission for the Accreditation of Professional Genealogists, otherwise known as ICAP-GEN, for research in the Denmark region. He has a deep passion for both Scandinavian and DNA research and works full-time as a research specialist at the Family Search Library in Salt Lake City, Utah. Tanner also serves as the second vice president of the Utah Genealogical Association and as a co-administrator of the Yeoman's YDNA Surname Project. He enjoys family history, Palpatine, bacon burgers, and Venusaur, but most of all, he enjoys spending time with his wife playing with their three small children. So I am going to turn the time over to Tanner with why oh why do your YDNA. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm super excited to be doing this presentation today. Um, why, why do your YDNA? Okay, so these are the objectives for this class today. Um, we're gonna be looking specifically at the Y chromosome and go a lot more in depth into it. Um, so the goals is that you will understand what YDNA is um, and understand how YDNA can help you with your genealogy um, but most importantly, I hope this class will help you to be excited about YDNA and its potential. Um, so the Y chromosome is something that was discovered in 1905. It was the last part of the human genome to be discovered. Um, and it is the biological mechanism that determines um, your sex. Um, it is the presence or absence of a Y chromosome that determines if you are born a male or a female. Now, the Y chromosome is 62 million base pairs long. Um, so what that means is each base pair is one of four molecules, um, adenine, 
thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Those are the four letters in DNA, and they are abbreviated as uh, A, C, G, and T. Um, so if you were to take the Y chromosome and you were to lie it flat um, and stretch it out, the leftmost gene, the leftmost base pair, um, is base pair one. And then they go up sequentially. So they one and then two is next to it, and then three is next to that one, and four, all the way up to 62 million, which sounds like a really high number, um, but that is actually very small by chromosome standards. It's one of the smallest chromosomes in the human genome. Um, there are a total of only 693 genes on it, which really isn't very many. Um, but the main and most important gene that's on the Y chromosome is the one that is in charge of producing testosterone. And that is why it's the Y chromosome that determines um, biological sex. So the Y chromosome um, is only inherited father to son. And so you got your Y chromosome from your biological father who got it from his biological father, from his biological father, all the way back to the first man who ever lived. Now, the, as Beth explained in the previous class, the rest of the chromosomes are going to mix and match um, and they're gonna go through a recombination process um, before you inherit them. But the Y chromosome does not, it's just you either get all of the Y chromosome or you don't. Um, so the only way the Y chromosome can change is through mutations. And mutations is basically where it just randomly changes at a random point. And then that change is then passed on from the first person who had it to all of their living patrilineal descendants. Um, all of the chromosomes do mutate, but the Y chromosome mutates much faster than all of them. Um, it is the fastest changing part of the human genome um, because of the way um, because of the way that it's passed on. Um, the Y chromosome is stored in a highly oxidized environment, um, and so it ends up mutating more. And that's actually really good for us at, as genealogists because it mutates fast enough that we can start to track those mutations for genealogical purposes. I've heard some people say that there's an average of about two mutations every generation. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually that fast, but I have heard it, I have heard that. Okay, so what we're gonna do is now we're gonna talk about the brief history of man. And really this is about ancient haplogroups. So, all men alive today descend from one most recent common patrilineal ancestor. That man is nicknamed Y chromosomal Adam. Now, he was not the first man to ever live, and he was certainly not named Adam, and he is definitely not biblical Adam. This is just a nickname. Um, if you, you know, if you don't believe in the Bible, then you don't believe biblical Adam existed. And if you do believe in the Bible, then the most recent man that all of our Y chromosomes converge at should really be Noah. So I kind of think Y chromosomal Noah would actually have been a better nickname for this particular person. Um, and this Y chromosomal Adam is not even a fixed person in time. As Y lineages go extinct, he can become more recent in time. So if you would like to become Y chromosome Adam, all you need to do is kill every other man on earth and then single-handedly repopulate the earth. And then congratulations, Thanos, your Y chromosome Adam. But currently, um, Y chromosome Adam belong to something called haplogroup A. And this is the original haplogroup that all other Y chromosomes descend from. So what happened with Y chromosome A, some people have that chromosome today, um, but pretty early on in our history, there was a mutation that created haplogroup BT. And what happened here is 
a random gene in a random spot. So I listed the exact place. Um, so base pair, 6,932,831 mutated from a G to an A. So what that means is, again, if you take the Y chromosome and you lie it down flat, um, the leftmost butt is uh, base pair one and the rightmost is base pair 62 million. So this is actually still pretty far to the left side. It's only about 10% of the way across the chromosome. Um, y chromosome Adam and everybody in haplogroup A and every man who had ever lived up to this point happened to have a guanine molecule here. But this one person happened to have a mutation that changed it from G to A. Um, and then that mutation got through the quality controls um, and then survived. And then basically he passed down that A to um, all of his sons. And so that mutation is a key marker. Um, now this mutation would have been invisible at the time. This man would not have known there was anything different about him and none of his contemporaries would have. Like this didn't give him superpowers. This didn't give him um, purple eyes. It didn't really do anything. Um, but we know that it we know that it happened um, because of all the people who have taken Y DNA tests today. Um, and we determine that this is a very early mutation. It is a key marker. Um, all men today, um, except for people who are in haplogroup A, have this mutation. So this man who formed haplogroup BT, whoever he was, he had two sons. And I've put sons in parentheses because they're not necessarily literal sons. They are just patrilineal descendants. So they could be sons, grandsons, 10th great grandsons. Um, but eventually the line further split from him with these two more mutations that formed B and C, uh, B and CT. Now we don't have time to talk about every single haplogroup um, that exists today. I did put interesting information about each of the haplogroups in the handout. So you can look up yours if you know what it is. Um, but I'm going to follow this all the way down to something called RM269, which is the most common haplogroup in Europe. Um, it's a very common one, um, and it's also my haplogroup. Okay, so the next one is haplogroup CT. And this one branched off from BT when this random mutation, this time 14.8 million base pairs in, happened to change from a C to a T. So all of humanity up until this point had the cytosine molecule, but this man ended up having that change to a thymine and all of his patrilineal descendants now also have thymine at this spot. Um, you don't need to worry about all this and memorize this. Um, I don't want this to become overwhelming with all of these numbers and letters that I'm giving. What I'm trying to emphasize is that these mutations are random um, and the only thing that is special about these mutations is that they happened so long ago. So it's literally just think of it as a random number, um, a random point along the Y chromosome randomly changing from one letter to another. Um, and then by testing to see whether you have the ancestral value, which is C in this case, or the derived value, which is T in this point, we can determine where um, and the big Y chromosome pedigree of mankind, you fit. Okay, so CT has two sons again, um, CF and DE. Okay, so CF branched off when another one, also about 14 million base pairs in, mutated from G to A. Um, I do wanna mention once these mutations happen, they are more or less permanent. Um, it is possible that you may have a mutation that changes one of these ancient genes back to the original value, um, but that would be exceedingly rare because it would have to be that exact same gene reversing back exactly to what it used to be. So these mutations are stockpiling on each other. Okay, so CF has two sons, C and F. 
Um, and F was formed when this random mutation, 21 million genes in, changed from C to T. And he has two sons, F and GHIJK. GHIJK, this is an extinct macro haplogroup. Um, ha haplogroups G, H, I, J, and K, all five of them ended up breaking off from each other in quick succession. Um, G, if you, this one is thought to have been owned by the first farmers in Europe. Um, so if that's your haplogroup, your ancestry would go back to those people. I is typically found in the first people in Europe. So not the first farmers, but the first like hunter gatherers. And it's also commonly survives in Scandinavians today. Um, later people in Europe end up descending through um, K or one of its sub haplogroups. Haplogroup K, now this one is found on low levels um, on every continent except Antarctica. And I've stopped listing the random mutations now just because I don't want to bog down the presentation. But each of these haplogroups is defined by a random gene just changing somewhere from one to another. Um, haplogroup K is rare and under-researched. So if you happen to be in haplogroup K, there's probably going to be some scientists who want to talk to you. Um, K itself, basal K, is pretty rare. Um, but L, M, N, O, P, uh, P, S, T, all end up breaking off from it. And they are all much more common. Okay, so haplogroups P, Q, and R. Um, P broke off from K, and then Q and R end up breaking off from P. R is very commonly found in Europeans, and Q is very commonly found in Native Americans. So... All of those mutations represent just kind of the first mutations that were happening, um, and each forming the major branches of the human family. But then you go down more um, branches to like smaller branches and twigs um, to your exact specific place. So RM269 is a distant descendant of R. Um, so there were several mutations in between the two um, that all stockpile up to make RM269. Now, RM269 is commonly associated with the Yamnaya culture. And these were interesting people. They were the first people to have the Indo-European language. Um, they're thought to have lived in the, um, in the steppe grasslands of Asia. And then some of them ended up going west into Europe. And some of them ended up going south into India. And that is why the European languages are actually related to the Indian languages today. So that's the general story of RM269. So this process of mutation was happening anciently with those random genes changing from one to another, um, but it continues to happen to this day. Each mutation, um, mutations are happening all the time and you very probably actually do have a mutation on your Y chromosome that makes your Y chromosome different from the rest of humanity. So each major haplogroup has many more sons, which are sub haplogroups. So R, for example, breaks off into R1 and R2, and R1 breaks off into R1b and R1a. And more and more of these haplogroups are being discovered all the time. So this is useful for us as genealogists. Genetic genealogists, what we're doing um, is we are looking for recent haplogroups and more recent mutations that may have happened um, recent enough that we can um, identify distinct branches of a family um, and particular surnames. Um, so what we do is we look for these more re recent mutations um, and we try and link them to specific people. Um, basically, we're trying to breathe life into this information. So it's no longer just a random interesting gene, um, but we try and figure out who the first man who ever had that mutation was. And then everybody else who also has that mutation today is a direct descendant of that man. Um, so we're basically taking these mutations and we're giving them names, dates, and faces. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about testing options. 
So if you are interested in using the Y chromosome to break down brick walls, family tree DNA is king because they're the only one that is going to test the Y chromosome with enough detail to give you a match list, like people who are related on your patrilineal line. Um, other companies will test the Y chromosome a little bit. They technically all do. Um, and if you're just interested in knowing what your haplogroup is, like if it's RM269 or O or something like that, um, 23andMe will actually give you that information um, as part of your test. Um, but for as specifically for match lists, um, family tree DNA is the only one that's going to give you that. And you you have to actually test with them. You cannot transfer from another company if that's what you want to get, because the other companies just don't test it um, with enough detail. So family tree DNA has three options for um, this Y chromosome test. There's the Y37, 111, and big Y. And family tree DNA ends up also sells mitochondrial tests and autosomal tests. And so I've put this little green box around the one that you want. It's this paternal ancestry one. Okay, so. Oh shoot, I was behind a slide. So. Here is, here's the options that family tree DNA presents. Um, it's this one that I've put this box around, um, uh, this green box right here, this paternal ancestry, those are your Y chromosome tests. Okay, so I wanna talk about Saturn for a little bit. When I was a young boy, like seven, eight years old, um, I was really interested in astronomy and one of the highlights of my childhood was getting to go see Saturn with my own eyes. Um, we had a neighbor who was really in, really good at astronomy, and he invited me and my mom to come over to his house at like four in the morning. And we showed up and he had this um, telescope out and it was like five feet long and it was a pretty big telescope. And he knew exactly where to point this telescope into the sky. And I looked through it and I got to see Saturn. And it looked fairly similar to this image that I'm showing. It was really small. Um, and he had to keep adjusting the telescope because Saturn actually moves. And so he had to keep moving it or Saturn would have just moved out of the field of vision. But I could see the planet and I could see the rings just like this. This is what a Y37 test is like. Um, I've put the base prices at the top. Um, they do go on sale sometimes. Um, I don't work for Family Tree DNA, um, but I'm just giving you the information. And they are actually on sale today. Um, but a Y37 is the cheapest Y chromosome test that you can get. And it predicts your broad haplogroup and your closest relatives. Um, the keyword is predicts. There can be false positives. Um, for the most part, it's pretty good. Um, this test may suggest your genetic surname. So if you take a Y37 test and all of your matches come back as Tolmans, um, then your biological father probably had the Tolman name. Um, it's a really good test for testing the waters and just seeing if you have matches. Um, why DNA match why DNA databases are smaller than autosomal ones. And so sometimes you take a Y test and you really don't have any matches in the database. Um, and so basically you, you want to take this test and just, you know, you just want to see if you have a planet in your scope of vision at all. And if you do have a planet, then you may consider upgrading your test to one of the higher tests, and that's like zooming in on the planet. Um, one of the great things um, about a Y-DNA test is you can upgrade um, from a lower level to a higher level by paying the difference. And you don't actually have to retest as long as you've bought at least the Y-37. Okay, so the Y-111 basically does everything that the Y-37 does except more accurately. 
Um, it also just predicts your broad haplogroup and your closest relatives. Um, and it provides more accurate relationship estimates than the Y37. Um, so it's like looking at Saturn um, like on a mountain. So the Y37 is like me looking at Saturn, um, you know, just from that little telescope as a little kid. Maybe the Y111 is you've got like one of those big telescopes that are up in the mountains on a clear day and you're looking at it um, that way. So you're going to see Saturn in more detail and you're going to see how you're related to your matches in more detail as well if you have matches. But if you don't have matches at Y37, you will not get new matches by upgrading to Y111. Um, you're just going to zoom in on the matches that you already have. The big Y700. Now this, I love this test. Um, it's a very expensive test. Um, it is the most expensive test that a genealogist is ever likely to buy. And this one proves your extremely specific haplogroup and your closest relatives. So the Y37 and the 111 will just predict it up to like RM269. Um, but the big Y is going to tell you exactly which subbranch of subbranch of subbranch of subbranch of RM269 you belong to. Um, and those are very specific. Um, those are usually formed within the, the past couple centuries or so. And they are specific enough that everybody who is in that exact haplogroup usually just has one surname. So it's a very, very good test. And this is the one that we are using to solve complicated genealogical problems far back in our tree when there's no paper trail and when it's too far back for autosomal DNA to use. So like this one, we're zooming in on Saturn even more. Now you see the, the rings of Saturn and which ice mountain or particle within those rings your ancestor lived on specifically. So it is a very high-tech um, and um, accurate test. Okay, so we are going to do a case study now. Um, so I am a co-administrator on the Yeomans YDNA surname project. Now there are a lot of surname projects and a, the people who are co-administrators on them know, and admins, they know a lot of detailed information about the specific mutations that belong to that surname. What I recommend you do is I always Google the surname I'm interested in, and then the phrase YDNA surname project. And if there is one, it will usually be the top result. And it will tell me how many people are in the project. Um, and you might be thinking, well, I have too common of a surname for that to be helpful, like Smith. Well, actually, there is a Smith YDNA surname project, and it has 4,000 members. And they're trying to figure out which Smiths are all related to which ones. Um, but the Yemen project is a much smaller project. We have like 83 members. Um, okay, so there was a man named Christopher Yeomans. And he was born 1638 in England. Um, he married in 1662 and he had like 11 kids, like five of which five were sons, um, Moses, Christopher, Solomon, Thomas, and William. And then he eventually dies in 1720. Now, the reason Christopher is interesting to me is because so my, my grandfather is a Yemen. Um, I'm just going to. I'll call him Grandpa Yaman. That's what I call him in, in life. Um, and we have traced Grandpa Yaman's ancestry back to a man named John Yaman's, who was a politician in um, New York. Um, up to that point, we have it proven with the paper trail. And we suspect that John Yaman's descended from Christopher, like that they were um that Christopher was his great grandfather. Um, but the paper trail is just not sufficient for us to prove it. So we learned that there it was a Yeoman YDNA surname project. And we talked to the admins and 
the admins told us that there were proven descendants of Christopher in the database uh, who had taken the big Y. And if Grampy Amon also took a big Y, we could determine if we are related to Christopher or not. So we went ahead and we got my grandpa a Y37. Um, they recommended that we buy the Y37 and just, just see if we're genetically Yamans at all, because maybe there's a, you know, a non-paternal event that we don't know about. And this was my grandfather's match list. And I had to cover up the names of living people to protect their privacy. Um, but this is his 37 marker match list. And all of his matches have the yeoman or a yeoman or a, you know, a variant of it um, for their last name. So like this is testing the waters. This is a good match list. And this is something that we would want to consider upgrading to the to the big Y. Um, now, typically, the lower the genetic distance, which is this right here, um, this one step, um, the lower the genetic distance, the closer you probably are related to this person. But a Y37 match list is actually fuzzy, just like me as a seven-year-old looking at Saturn. Um, what I mean by that is not necessarily these people are in the right order. So because I know these people and I've done the research, I can tell you that one of these people is a second cousin to Grampy Amon. The others are all related, but they are like 10th cousins or something so distant that they're, you know, we can't prove what the exact connection is and there's no autosomal DNA. Now, which one do you think is the second cousin? You would probably think that it's one of these first two with the genetic distance of one, but the second cousin is actually this last one right here with the genetic distance of three. He's actually closer than all the others um, in reality, even though the Y37 thinks he is farther away. Okay, now, all of them over here, they have this new little calendar thing. And if you click on it, um, it estimates how far back it thinks the common ancestor is based on the number of mutations that there are. So if we go ahead and click on this one down here um, between Grampy Amon and Mr. Second Cousin, this is what it shows us. Um, it says, based on the fact that there is a genetic distance of three, we think the common ancestor was born about 1500, um, but we think it's anywhere between 1000 and 800 BC, which definitely makes a difference for our genealogy because that means that the common ancestor could be in genealogical times or before. Now, it's definitely in genealogical times because he really is a second cousin, uh, but this is the Y37. Now, if we look at Grampy Amon's match list at 111, the second cousin has actually moved up to the second closest relative. Um, the genetic distance is six, it's gone up, but that's because the number of genes that we've tested have also gone up. But it is more accurately predicting where he goes. And if we click on this little relationship predictor, now it's estimating the common ancestor is born about 1600 as opposed to 1500. And this is the big Y, and this is very, this looks very technical. Um, what really matters about this is the order. The big Y is crystal clear. It's going to get that order perfectly. And it's here at the big Y that second cousin finally takes his proper place as the closest relative. There's the shared variant thing over here. And basically the higher this number is, the closer they are. Um, now, this is the haplogroup story. This is something new that Family Tree DNA started offering in September. And it basically tells you the general story of your haplogroup. So what on earth does any of this mean? Um, basically, it now tells what your exact haplogroup is. In this case, it's this RFTA12568. Um, it says it branched off from this haplogroup. Um, this RFT, 16194, these are all big, long numbers. Um, 
Um, and right here, this is the part that you care about. Um, it's This is the part where it estimates the most recent common ancestor. So it's now moved it to 750. So the big Y estimated that the common ancestor, or sorry, the, the Y37 estimated the common ancestor lived in 1500. The 111 estimated 1600. And the big Y estimated 1750. Now, the truth is that the common ancestor was this man, Michael David Yeaman. And Michael was my third great grandfather. He was born September 26, 1846 in Iowa. So he was born about 90 years, about 100 years after what even the big Y estimated. But the big Y was the most accurate of the three, for sure. Um, he ended up marrying in 1866, and he died in 1935. Um, so what we found by giving a big Y to Grandpa Yeaman and his second cousin is that there is a unique mutation that exists only in their DNA and has not been observed in literally any other man on Earth. And it is this random mutation right here, 19,361,821 um, base pairs in. The rest of humanity, up until this point, um, all the way back to Y chromosome atom, they all had the adenine molecule, the A molecule. Um, but in Grandpa Yeaman and his cousin, they both have the thymine molecule. And since they both have it, they both must have inherited it from their father from, and from his father and from his father all the way back to Michael David Yeaman. So Michael must have been born with, with this T, with this thymine mutation. It is a special gene that kind of marks our branch of the Yeaman family. Now, Michael could have been the first man on earth to have that novel T, pun intended, um, or that really could have been his father, his grandfather, or his great-grandfather. Um, what we really need to do is do more testing to figure out exactly who the first person was who had it. But we do know that it existed by Michael David Yeaman. Um, I'm guessing that it was, you know, maybe his grandfather or something that was the first person to have it. Um, but I do not know the exactly who it was. So our research question that we want to try and solve with Big Y is, was Michael David Yeaman a descendant of Christopher? So we got the Y37. We confirmed that Grampy Yeaman had Yeaman and Yeoman matches. And then we went ahead and we upgraded him to big Y. And we also got that second cousin. Um, so here's what the previous admins had found about the Yemen haplogroup. So the original Yemen code um, is this RFT161984. And basically between 700 and 1500, or really between 700 and like 1630, um, when Christopher was born, um, there were 26 random mutations that each independently happened. So the first mutation would have happened probably in a man born about 17, uh, 700. Um, and then there would have been another one and another one and another one and another one. And these 26 mutations have all, basically all test takers today um, that who have tested so far, either have all 26 or they have none of them. So these 26 mutations come in a block. Um, these are the 26 mutations. Um, I just listed them just for fun. Um, again, you don't need to worry about like this. Um, I don't want this to become overwhelming. Um, they've given a name to each mutation. So the name of it right here. And then this is the position. And then this left gene, the C in this top left box, that is the ancestral value. 
and this a that is the mutated or derived value um so there are these 26 mutations basically that all descendants of Christopher Yeoman have. <clears throat> so basically, um, be all, because all people in the all genetic Yeomans in the surname project have all 26 markers, um, we can conclude just from that 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 man must have been born probably in England, whoever the, the most recent common ancestor of all Yemens is, um, must have been born in Eng England, had a yeoman-ish name, so yeoman, yeoman, something like that, and two or more sons. Um, that's what we can tell with the Y-DNA evidence. And then um, what the surname projects have done is basically figured out that that most recent man is Christopher. Um, So RFT169 basically had two sons or two patrilineal subhaplogroups that break off of it. This is what the project admins explained to us before we ended up buying the big Y. They said, you know, there's this one mutation that um, is present in everybody who is in a group of Northern Yemens who have tested. And there is this different mutation that is present in all of these Southern Yemens who have tested. In addition to the 26 previous mutations that I showed, and those 26 previous mutations that all independently evolved between 700 and like 1630, um, and we don't know the order that they evolved in. Now, they had done a lot of research private previously. They had like 20 people who had all taken big Y, and what they had found is that all people who had that key marker for the Northern group descended from Christopher's son, Solomon. And that key mutation was this ba random base pair, 23.4 million genes in, that had changed from a C to an A. And they had done enough testing to determine that Solomon must have been the first man on earth to have been born with it. Because Christopher's other proven descendants who have tested, if they don't come from Solomon, they don't have that gene. So what we've done with all of these big Y testing if, is we have found one unique gene, one unique mutation that Solomon was the first man on earth to be born with. And so we can now determine if you descend from Solomon by the presence or absence of that mutation. It is a unique marker that identifies all of his patrilineal descendants. Now the Southern group, um, all members who have this mutation descend from a man named Levi. And Levi was a great grandson of Christopher through his son, Christopher II, who would have been a brother of Solomon. <laughs> and it is marked by this key um, random base pair that changed from a C to a T. Now we need to do some more testing on this one. Um, we know that Christopher I did not have this mutation and Levi did. So Levi was the son of John Robert Yeomans, who was the son of Harris Yeoman, who was the son of Christopher II. So one of those four men was the first person to ever have that mutation. So basically, what we, thanks to all the work that these previous admins had done, we can now determine how Grandpa Yaman fits into the Yaman family just by looking at a handful of SNPs. Um, now, rather than list all of those 26 um, mutations that are unique to the Yaman family in general, I just chose to list one of them um, because we don't know what order they happened. And so basically what Family Tree DNA has done is they have named, they, they have basically just guessed. And I don't know how they picked the one that they did, um, but they just picked one of those to name the haplogroup after. 
um, and that is called the terminal snip. And so that's the one that I've just put on this here, right? So just looking at those at those key snips, um, if we are not genetic Yamans, at all three of these values, um, all of them, the ancestral value happens to be a C. Now, um, if he is a Yaman, um, this key one representing all 26 others that have mutated is this random base pair here changing to an A. So if Grandpa Yaman is a genetic Yaman, he should have an A in this spot. Now, if he descends from Solomon, he should have that A that marks all Yamans. And this third gene down here should also be an A. Now, if he descends from Solomon, but not Levi, he should have the A that makes all Yamans. He shouldn't have Solomon's G, so he, Solomon's gene, so he should still have the ancestral value, which is C, but he should have this T that marks him as a descendant of Levi. Now, we thought that the results were going to show that he descended from Solomon because those were where his closest matches were on the Y37. Now, these were his big Y700 results. He had A, C, C. So he had the original Yaman code. So what this that existed in Christopher. So what this means is the big Y proves that Grandpa Yaman and Christopher Yeomans definitely were related. Um, but Grandpa Yaman does not descend from Solomon and he does not descend from Levi. Now, the project admins were very excited when this happened because up until this point, they had only identified those two groups. Um, they did not know that there was anybody alive today that still had that original Yemen haplogroup. They thought everybody simply belonged to the northern group or the southern group. Um, and so they were, but they did notice a couple of mutations that were unique to Grampy Yemen. Now, family tree DNA has a rule, and I don't quite understand why they have this rule, but it takes two big Ys to have the same unique mutation to confirm that it really is like a, a new haplogroup and to create a new branch of the family. So what they suggested we do is test a second or a, a first or a second or a third cousin. Um, and just to confirm what we were seeing here. So that's how the second cousin ended up testing um, the common ancestor between Grandpa Yaman and him being Michael David Yaman. And that's where they found this novel thymine, this novel T gene um, that is present in the descendants of Michael and everyone else. So what we now have is this, basically this is a genetic tree. Um, we know that Christopher, thanks to the proven descendants of Solomon and Levi, we know that Christopher belonged to this RFT161984 haplogroup. Um, that is marked by these 26 mutations that make it different from everyone. Then there is a key mutation that existed in Solomon and marks all of Solomon's descendants. There's a key mutation in Levi that marks all of his descendants. And there is a key mutation in Michael David Yaman that marks all of his descendants. So there's at least three branches of the tree, probably, probably more. There is one person in the project who so far just has that basal original haplogroup. Um, and what I believe is going to happen is once one of his relatives also tests, um, that they will be able to then prove a unique marker that is unique to his branch of the family. And this is it's going to split off into another branch. So the big why, what we have proven basically by comparing Grampy Amon's DNA against all the other test takers, is that Michael David Amon and Grampy Amon definitely were related to Christopher. Now, they do not necessarily descend from him. Um, I suspect that they do, um, but it is possible that they descend from like Christopher's brother or Christopher's cousin or something like that. So what we need to do to really prove this 
even further is we just need to test more people. And ultimately we need to test as many Yemens as possible. Um, so there was another man named Sir John Yemens um, and he was the governor of South, Carol South Carolina. He was a very colorful man. He and his posterity ended up moving to Barbados and becoming prominent people there. Um, and then the Yemen family um, originates from Bristol. Um, so we wanna test descendants of Sir John in Barbados. We will especially wanna test Yemens who are still alive in England and Bristol today. And also any and all Yemens who are willing to test. Now, the reason we want to do this is we have these 26 mutations that make Christopher's descendants um, and Christopher's relatives different from everybody else on Earth. Um, but it's highly, highly improbable that all 26 originated in Christopher, that he was just born with all of these mutations. Um, they'd really been stockpiling um, since about 700. And we don't know the order that they happened in. Um, but I've done the math on this and there's 26 of these key mutations um, and we've got about 800 years that they were forming. It works out to be about one yeah. mutation every generation or so. Um, so what we wanna do by testing other relatives and Sir John and people in Bristol is we are hoping that some of them will have some of these 26, but not all of them. We wanna try and split these. Um, if we find somebody who has 13 of these mutations, but not the other 13, what that would mean is the 13 mutations they have must have been the first 13. So we're starting to figure out the order. And then after those first 13 mutations were formed, they, then that's where their common ancestor is and they then split off from our tree. And then the other mutations happened after that. Um, and the goal is to hopefully prove, and I believe that there is one, is to prove that one of these 26 mutations that Christopher was the first person on earth to have it. Um, we wanna figure out which one of these um, and hopefully there is one, that Christopher is that first person to have it because then everybody on earth who has that mutation must descend from Christopher. And so we want, by finding that, we can then prove, yes, Michael David Yeaman really is his descendant or somebody who has um, 25 of these 26 mutations, but not the key one that Christopher was born with that person would probably be like descended from Christopher's first cousin or his brother or somebody very close, but not actually Christopher. Um, so we need a lot more test takers. And this is the kind of stuff that um, project admins and surname projects are doing. Um, you don't necessarily need to worry about all this. Um, this is stuff that the admins are doing for you. Um, joining a YDNA surname project is one of the best things you can do for your genealogy because you're basically getting a YDNA expert who is interested in your surname doing research for you for free. They may want you to, um, you know, to pitch in and buy the big Y yourself. Maybe some of them, if they're richer, can, um, can afford to pay for it for you. Um, but then essentially they are tracking all these mutations and um, giving you the answer, um, you know, on like a silver platter. So the Y chromosome, it's, really, really cool. Um, you can use it to prove things like this. Like Christopher Yeoman is like 20 generations back in my tree. Um, but by using the big Y, we can determine if we are related to him or not. And so far, the results show, yes, he definitely is a relative and he probably is a direct ancestor. Um, so, what testing your Y-DNA can do is it can determine your haplogroup. And depending on the level of tests that you buy, it can give you a, you know, a broad ancient haplogroup, or if you buy the big Y, a very specific one. Um, it can determine what your genetic surname is if you have the right people in the database. 
and it can answer your deep genealogical questions like this one. So that is the big why, and that is why you should do your Y-DNA. All right, um, we have time for questions now, if anybody has any. Um, Fantastic, thanks for that presentation, Tanner. Um, we did have some questions in the chat. Um, if you have more questions, please add them to the chat, and remember that we only have a few minutes. Um, our first question comes from Marion. She says, None of my husband's oh. Tanner, we our first question comes from Marion. She says, none of my husband's Y37 matches share the same surname. Would the big Y test help with this? Um so the big Y, if any of them have taken the big Y and you can, it will tell you what they have. It'll say it, it um, the big Y will show you which ones are the closest relatives. Um, it could be that they are all related um, either pre surname or the time that surnames are forming. Um, so yes, it could help, um, but I need to see the results specifically to give a better answer. Okay, and along the same lines, Greg asked, would there be an advantage of upgrading from Y67 to Y111? And Pat asked, she has the Y500 test, should they still buy the Y700 test? Would it be beneficial? Um, the more meet, the, the higher level of test you pay for, um, the more accurate your match list is going to be. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would upgrade. Um, you know, I, I, under, I understand it's expensive. Um, I, you know, I tell my wife, I, I wish what I want to do is become the president of the United States. I think the best kept secret is becoming president and, and doing a crap job. So you don't get reelected because, um, a one-term president and a two-term president both get $400,000 for the rest of their life every year. Um, and I don't, don't see Four hundred thousand dollars. I see a hundred thousand big Y's per year. Great, thanks, Tanner. Um, Betsy asked. She said, "My father tested his DNA through Ancestry and is now deceased. Is it possible to transfer his test results to Family Tree DNA for Y DNA results?" Unfortunately, no. All right, that's good to know. Um, Barbara asks, what would you recommend for those of us with patronymic surnames? Um, okay, so for patronymic surnames, um, usually sur uh, surname projects are not a thing um, because the, you know, the surname is changing every generation, um, but you can still absolutely um, target test. Um, typically, like the Scandinavian countries, they have really, really good records um, and a really good paper trail. Um, and so what I've done is I, I, I found an ancestor who was, you know, on a patronal, you know, he was in Denmark and, um, there was a man that we were pretty confident was probably his father. Um, but there just wasn't a birth record to prove it. And so we found one of his other sons who did have a birth record and found his patrilineal descendant and we tested his Y chromosome and it ended up matching, which proved that yes, they were related. So a surname project you can't really use, but you can still um, you can still buy a test for two different people and see if they match. And that is something called uh, target testing. Thanks, Tanner. That's a great suggestion. So Laura asks, what is the best Y DNA test to start with for an unknown parentage case? Do I have to do the big Y? Um. Yeah, I mean, the big Y is awesome for a lot of reasons, um, and I would hope that you do buy it. But um, just to start out, I would recommend buying the Y37, you know, and just see if you have a match list at all. Um, and then if you do, then you might want to consider upgrading, depending on your results, um, to figure out which ones are the closest. But um, if you, you know, if you're working with a budget like most people, including me, uh, start with Y37. Okay, and then Tank Dog 2012 says, I don't have any 111 matches at all. Why would that be? Um, 
because the match the the database is much smaller. Um, so there's about two hundred thousand people who have taken Big Y in the world. Um, and meanwhile, there's like twenty one million people who have taken an autosomal test through Ancestry. Um, I did the math once and I determined that for every one man who has taken a Y DNA test, there are 75 people who are in Ancestry's database. Um, so there's a lot more testing that needs to be done. Um, and that's that's just why. Great. Marsha asks, what value would Y DNA have for women? So women do not have a Y chromosome, but they do have patrilineal ancestors. And so if you're interested in somebody on this direct Y line, um, what you want to do is test your father or your brother or your first cousin who, you know, like is on this patrilineal line and their Y chromosome can represent your branch of the family. Wonderful. So we had several people ask how mutations are formed. Are they environmental? Are they just completely random? And then is it possible for a mutation to mutate back? Mutations just happen. They are just entirely random. Um, they do happen a little bit more in the Y chromosome. Um, and that is just because um, the sperm are highly oxidized and that oxidized environment encourages more mutations to happen. But so like, think about this. Have you ever read like say you're reading, you know, you're reading a 600 page book about the fall of Rome. The professor who wrote it is like the subject matter expert on Rome. And he's using all of these big complicated words and he's highly technical. But then you find that at one random spot, he misspelled very, like he added an extra E in it. Um, and that, that random typo, you know, he didn't catch and his publisher also didn't catch um, and then the book got published with it um, that's kind of how a mutation happens it just you know it's just basically a random mistake or a random typo that the quality control part of your cells just don't catch um, but then unlike the book um, once that mistake happens it's then passed on to your sons and your grandsons and all of your patrilineal descendants like the book maybe the professor will read it one day and realize he made a typo and just quietly change it and republish the book. But that doesn't happen with DNA. They just, they stockpile. And yes, it is possible that a random mutation will change it back to the original value. Um, but it's very rare, um, like exceedingly rare, because that exact specific gene would just have to happen to change back. Once that mutation gets through quality control, um, your, you know, your DNA thinks that that's the correct value going forward. Wonderful. So one last question. Um, Margaret asks, would my father pass down a Y from his grandfather to my brother? Yes. Wonderful. So she could have her brother tested for the Y DNA. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Tanner. This has been a fantastic presentation. Our time for questions regarding this has expired, but if you need help with a specific DNA research problem, we encourage you to sign up to meet one-on-one -on -one with one of our DNA specialists in a free 40-minute virtual consultation. You just go to the Family Search Library's website at familysearch.org library and click on research help. And we are only scheduling those out uh, two weeks, so you'll need to keep checking back till you find an open slot. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. We will take a short break and then get started again in just a few minutes with our next presentation entitled Getting Started with Autosomal DNA Part 1, Clustering, presented by Beth Taylor at 1130. Thanks again.